it is silly season. So how do we stay informed and engaged and sort through all the noise and all the campaign rhetoric and all the moves being made and all the cynicism that tends to crush us down and make us not go out and vote, especially locally? How do we get past that? Ah. Well, getting voter engagement up is a huge priority here at the O Show for all the people on our team. And so we decided that we would start a new series, The Five Things, The Five Things That Need to Change as a Result of This Huge Election Coming Up on October 24th. So we thought we would reach out to different thought leaders in our community, some who have been OSHO guests in the past, some who have never been on the program, but people that we think we need to hear from in order to understand what would be their five things that they think need to change. And that I think gives us a reason to get out and vote. So let's hear from them, let's compare and contrast, uh, and let's try to get to the polls on October 24th, informed and understanding what our values are and what we can really achieve in this great city of Hamilton. Here to tell us about the five things they think need to change as a result of the municipal election on October 24th is none other than Kojo Damti. He has been on the program many times talking about different issues over the past year, and he's been very involved as a newsmaker and as the head of the Hamilton Center for Civic Inclusion. So great to have Kojo Damti back on the program. Kojo, tell us, what are your five things? Uh, I think the five things definitely number one is housing, <laughs> uh, affordability, uh, our democracy, mm. uh, systemic racism, and then uh, what I would classify as a re-education of our political polarization. Um, so for me, I think those would be the, the five key things that uh, that everybody should be engaged in, whether you are running for office or whether you are looking to cast a vote for a particular uh, individual or candidate, and also engaging with your neighbors as well. These are all the things that uh, we have to be talking about and understanding. So those would be my five. Uh, points. Well, no surprise, Kojo, that you've got them all organized and lined up quickly, but let's unpack them. Let's go through them so I can get more of an idea of the context of what you mean by each of these. Yes, so I think uh, when we talk about housing, there's a spectrum. So on, on one end, you have houselessness, emergency shelters, transitional housing, social housing, affordable rental housing, affordable home ownership, market rental housing and market home ownership. And housing experts have told us that we're missing the middle. So right from transitional housing all the way to affordable affordable home ownership. And I think that's where municipalities and, and the province uh, have to fill that gap. Um, I, I, we do know that everybody or most people think that you should just build uh, uh, semi-detached houses and it will solve the problem. But we need that, that middle because not everybody can afford a million dollar, a million dollar home. Not everybody can afford a 700K home. There are some people that want to rent homes. So do they have the capability to do that? So when we're talking about housing, I think we have to focus on that middle, not to say that you know houses shouldn't be shouldn't be built, but again, are we focusing on the middle that allows for different options, rental, uh, 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 dens densification around public uh, transit routes? Those are some of the things that we have to focus on, and I think that leads me to the next point, which is affordability, right? If people are not earning enough how are they going to purchase a house? And if people are not earning enough, how are they going to pay for their rent, right? So I think that when, we, when we're talking about affordability, we have to talk about a living wage, a, a living decent wage. We, we also have to talk about paid sick days that allow for people to, uh, 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 to be sick and at the same time <laughs> earn, earn a living. So, so when, when we are talking about how housing connects with affordability, that's the connection there. Because if people are not earning enough money and they can't pay rent, can't pay their mortgage, they are going to be uh, uh, left out on the, on the street. Koja, when I hear you talk about your priorities around housing and affordability, some people listening might think that that's a provincial issue. So 
how do you see that changing as a result of the municipal election? Yes, so thank you for that segue. That leads me to democracy, <laughs> right? I think when we talk about democracy in our Canadian political system, we have three tiers, federal, provincial, municipal. And what has happened is that everybody points their finger at each other. There's this uh, Spider-Man meme on the internet where everyone is pointing at each other. And we saw that during the, during the, during the pandemic and even with housing. Right, you have a you you have a, a a city council that is saying that we don't we don't want to focus on providing transitional housing for for folks. You have a provincial uh, uh, government that is saying that we just need to build and everything will be okay. You have a federal uh, government that has provided large sum of money, but are also not focusing on the middle, building social housing and affordable rental housing. So I think. We shouldn't be looking at these as silos. We should be looking at it as they are interconnected. If you have a council that's, that's, that's ready to use all of its levers to provide uh, uh, transitional housing, social housing, affordable rent, then you have a, a provincial government that's also focused on that. You can see some partnership forming and some dedicated uh, 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 action to address these issues. So I don't think we should look at them separately. We should look at them as a, as a whole system. Koja, when you talk about democracy, do you also mean transparency? Joey Coleman has often said that we are one of the most, if not the most, trans, uh, secretive council out there. The amount of in-camera meetings, uh, you know, trying to get rid of evening sessions of council, all these things that council does to keep all these secrets from us. Is that what you mean when you talk about democracy? Um, yes, that's part of it. I think there are many parts of it. I'll give you one example. As, as you know, on your, your last show last week, you talked about uh, the tragic incidents that have happened. If you tuned in to council, everybody there was like, this is bad, this is bad. The Ministry of Transportation needs to do something and nothing was done, right? So that is that is the crust of democracy. It's like you need leaders that are not not only going to comment and make proclamations, but they are going to provide action. They could have sent a letter to the, the Minister of uh, Transportation to say, hey, we need to do X, Y, and Z. They didn't do all of that. They just made proclamations and we moved on. And now we're going to wait until another tragedy happens. And then everybody's going to complain and, and, and make proclamations. So I think Again, it's about actions and not proclamations. But let's get to your fourth point. What's your fourth thing that needs to change? Systemic racism. I, I mean, I, I've, been, I've been on your show and, and other places talking about how we need to, we need to get a grasp on uh, systemic racism. It's in every, uh, every aspect of our society, education, healthcare, policing, what have you. And, I, and, and we really have to understand how it works. I think for most people, when you when you talk about racism, the initial response is, well, we're 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 can't we're a multicultural country, we're a country that uh, 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 that takes human human rights uh, serious, but yet uh, we see the grotesque uh, instances of systemic racism. And I think for both provincial and municipal elections, we need to ask. Our, 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 our candidates that are running, we need to ask them, what are they going to do about systemic, uh, systemic racism and, uh, and, and all the other forms it takes in, in our society? So that, that's an important uh, point. Well, let me, let me unpack that for a second because um, we don't know yet if Mayor Fred is gonna run again. We know that, uh, that former Mayor Bertina is going to run and we know that Keenan Loomis is going to run, but when the mayor spoke about the issue of systemic racism, you did an op-ed stating that he didn't understand the definition of it. So how can, so can you first just explain to us if you can, I know that's brief, but what did he get wrong? And also, you know, what faith do you have going forward that if uh, leaders don't even understand the issue, they're going to be able to do anything about it? Or do we need new leaders who do understand? Yeah, so first, uh, I think not everybody, I don't understand everything. Let me just put it that way. But uh, do you have a propensity to learn? 
And I think that has been the, 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 the issue with our current mayor. Um, this is not the first time I've had discussions with him around racism. So then when he goes out and his definition of systemic racism deals with just hiring practices, that tells me that he hasn't been paying uh, attention. So I think that question should be raised to all candidates, provincial, federal, municipal. What do you understand by systemic racism and what are you going to do? to address systemic racism. Because sometimes to what candidates do is during an election, they sidetrack the answer. And then when they're elected, they don't do anything about it. And the last one, uh, political polarization. And this might be a hard thing to, uh, 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 to unpack. Uh, there's a book uh, that I read is called uh, Amusing Ourselves by Neil Postman. And he talks about how uh, politics is it's a sport. It's about winners and losers. Yeah. So what has happened, how we get to political polarization is that when you have a, a, a party, it doesn't matter what party it is, when they win all the time, mm -hmm. they are trying to win. They are not trying to change the material needs of people. They are just trying to win. And when you're on the losing end, now your main concern is you want to win at all costs. So that is why we see political leaders using particular wedge issues to divide people to ensure that they have a majority of people to get them elected and not trying to change their material needs you look at you look at hamilton that when we talk about housing people are literally suffering to make ends meet people on odsp people on ow and we're not addressing those issues, but using us as, as wedge issues. So I think that political polarization, we need to figure out how to untangle this attitude of, of winning politics. Thank you so much, Kojo Damchi, for the five things that you think need to change during the upcoming municipal election and for being one of the voices that people trust on the issues they care about. Thanks for doing the show. As part of our series on the five things that need to change in Hamilton to try to get real engagement in the upcoming October 24th municipal election, I wanted to speak to Marvin Ryder. He is, of course, a university professor, but also someone who has done a lot to try to educate people locally on the issues that affect our community. And he was the chair of the transition board at the time of amalgamation. So Marvin knows of what he speaks. Marvin Ryder, it's great to have you here on the program. Well, Laura, first, if you don't mind, I wanted to just put out a, a couple of biases. So you pointed out I'm a professor at McMaster. I teach in the business school. So when I look at a city council, the mayor and the councilors, what I tend to see is a board of directors. It is, after all, the corporation of the city of Hamilton. And that group of people are responsible for a budget well in excess of $1 billion. And so what I'm looking for are good stewards of that, just like I'd be looking for in a hospital budget, or excuse me, in a hospital setting, or in any other large municipal organization, are they up to the task of running the city? And so that means for you and I, allocating the money to the libraries, the roads, the snow clearing, the, the garbage collection. These are mundane things, but if they don't work, they impact us in gigantic ways. So it's really against that backdrop, I see them as stewards. And just another quick note, you mentioned about low voter turnout. I think what you have in a city, uh, whether it's Hamilton or Toronto or any large metropolitan area, is you sort of have two groups of people. You have one group of people who've chosen this place as their home and they plan to live here forever. And therefore they are very vested in not only what the city does today, but what it's going to do five years, 10 years, 20 years from now. You have another group of people who are here temporarily. So for instance, I teach students at McMaster and most of them really don't care that much about Hamilton beyond the three or four years they're going to be here. And then after that, I'm going to go, my next job might be in Australia. And I'm going to worry about that when I get there. And all of those people, if they choose to vote, have the same vote. It is, we don't wait them that the person who's planning to live here for 40 years gets a better vote than someone who's only planning to be here for five years. And therefore, they perceive this quite differently. So if you go back to your question, what are the five things? I, my looking at this is if there's a change in council, or even if there's not a change in council, 
what are going to be the five big things on their agenda over the four years? And the first one, and these are not necessarily in any specific order, is the LRT. The, the LRT, which has been debated for the better part of a decade, now seems to have funding. Great, it's going to be built, and it's going to be mostly built over the term of the next council. Now, while this is a Metrolinx job, I'm just going to tell you the law of unexpected consequences is going to come into play a lot. So that as you are digging up sewers, as you're digging up the water, remember all that infrastructure has to be replaced before the LRT is put on top of the ground. There's going to be you know, uh, uh, gas lines cut. There's going to be water lines cut. People are going to be disadvantaged. And the city council is going to have to respond to that. Even though that's a Metro Lynx project, the city council is going to have to think workarounds for all this. Laura, let me just again give you a quick example of that. Remember, the LRT is going to replace buses, but in the meantime, we have buses. I've done much work for the Hamlin Street Railway, and people design their lives along a bus route. You disrupt that bus route, even move it two blocks, their lives are dramatically uh, changed. And so I think people are going to have lots of complaints during the process. How is city council going to handle that? So that would be my first thing that on, on my mind. On I'll give you a second one, then I'll pause, let you get a word in edgewise here. You know, another big project that's going to come to fruition under this council, the one we elect this fall, is the Pier 8 redevelopment. You know, we've heard much about, we're gonna create some public spaces, parkland along the water, great. There's talk of a signature tower. Then other people say, no, no, we don't want a tower that big. We want lower density, maybe more like townhouses, what have you. But this is going to become a reality over the next four years, or at least, shall I say, I hope it's going to become a reality over the next four years. Uh, this is the second mission for council to not stall and delay. I don't want to see this take 20 years to become a reality. I want to see things happen and I want to see them happen over the next four years. Well, Marvin, when I listen to your priorities one and two, it's a lot of work. It's a lot for the new council to have to chew on. Do you think we can do that with the councillors that we have currently, or do we actually need to change the composition of council in order to get big projects like LRT and Pier 8 finally done? Yeah, those are, those are great questions. And it really is a personal choice on their part. You know, if they have bought into something, then let's execute. And, and there have been occasionally great examples where once they've bought into something, they pulled the trigger very quickly. The, why I think some of these bigger projects took longer to come to fruition is that people didn't buy in. Even though there was a vote, okay, it was nine to five, but the five didn't say, okay, that's the will of council. I'm going to get behind that. The five then used every chance they could to bring it back. Can't we reconsider it again? Let's go back. Let me slow this down that I'll win in the long run, even though I lost on the vote. And that is not what a board of directors does. And again, I realize that's an imprecise analogy, but if, if I'm on the board of some organization and we decide we're going to go right, even though I think we should go left, I have a choice. And that is to either get behind the movement to go right or get off the board rather than fight it and fight it and fight it. And Pier 8 is one of those great examples of, uh, I think, now here's the other side of this too. It's not just council, it's the staff. And there are 10,000 people who work for the city of Hamilton. Again, uh, uh, maybe even more now, it might be 12,000. Uh, there are good people there if they are allowed to do their job. But some of them you know, do their job, bring something to council, then they get smacked around and they go, oh, well, hmm, I guess I shouldn't do that. Go back. Okay, they go back. So now they begin reluctant to bring things to council or they're reluctant to bring it quickly for fear that council will say, well, you haven't done this, you haven't done this, you haven't done something else. So it's a team effort and we need a good council, but we need them to also empower the employees and support the employees. If I go back to my first example during the LRT, rather than pointing fingers, why didn't you know that that cross line was going to be cut? Why didn't you know that sewer was going to explode or whatever it was? It is, all right, how are we going to fix it and move on rather than pointing fingers about the past. And, and I think this, this mentality has to be shared on both sides. 
Well, there's even more egregious examples I can think of where staff yes. question about ambulances not being able to make it down some of those uh, streets where they were testing the bike lanes, right? As though staff would in any way inhibit emergency vehicles. I mean, so there. So is is a change of the culture at City Hall one of your top five, Marvin? Or let me yeah. let you continue with your uh, number yeah. three, four, and five. Well. You know, a culture is one of those hard things to define and even harder to change. And, and I am a big believer in a concept called tone at the top, tone at the top. Uh, whether it's the mayor specifically or the city council, in, in essence, they are the top of the pyramid and they set the tone for, for what you do. Now, Laura, as you know, I had a brief um, mm -mm, flirtation, flirtation with something council-like back in 2000 when I chaired the transition board that created the new city of Hamilton. And one of our jobs was to uh, watch the decisions made by various councils just to make sure they were not undermining the future of the new city of Hamilton. So we would have staff come to our meetings to present things which we could ratify, what have you. And I always remember, and I thought that was 20 years, 20 plus years ago, the number of times I got comments from staff that said, they liked coming to the transition board for two reasons. The first was we had clearly read their submission. We understood their submission. And then when we asked questions, we weren't there to score points. We weren't there to make them look stupid or small or unintelligent. Instead, we tended to ask good questions. Well, if you believe A and B, how about C? And they said, we felt challenged. We felt respected. We felt we were working together on the process. Now, to me, that's just the way I live my life. That's the way I do things at all levels of what I do. Uh, I just thought it was really odd that you'd have staff who said, I don't feel that I get that kind of, of respect. I don't get listened to. And also the flip side is I don't think they're always prepared appropriately for the meetings. Well, I have to tell you that we had on Councillor Pasuda on the O Show recently, and uh, he said that when he was sitting around that council table, they wouldn't prepare for the meetings. They wouldn't read the staff reports. He could tell by the questions that were being asked that the councillors hadn't even read the executive summary, I think was, was his comment. People, viewers can go back and check out, uh, write directly from Councillor Pasuda, what he felt was going on around that council table. So I'm not surprised that during the transition board meetings, staff was treated differently uh, or appreciated appreciated that you were prepared. Uh, so what do you have as your number three, four, and five, Marvin? Okay, well, let's move on. <clears throat> so uh, I, I mentioned one and two. Number three, we've seen both federally, and I suspect provincially during this upcoming election campaign, uh, money being targeted for, for lack of a better term, let me call it social housing. But uh, it's a lot of money at the federal level. It's more than $10 billion. But you've got to act nimbly and quickly and get projects out there to get the funding. And uh, I know this council has talked about it. For instance, we've seen the impact of homelessness on our streets. We've seen tent encampments. Nobody wants the tent encampments. What's the problem? Well, we don't have housing for those people to go into. And yes, I know there's been some innovation around these little tiny homes, almost look like little sheds, which are fine as a stopgap measure, but that would not be somebody's permanent home for the next 10, 15, 20 years. So, I think there is going to be a real challenge issued by the federal and the provincial government to, to step up to step up and really uh, start doing some serious building of social housing and keeping in mind again the power of the LRT, then the siting of that housing becomes critical. And I suppose number four is related to that. Uh, we are, I think, all familiar with the province's room to grow initiative, their planning for the next 25 years. They've gazed into a crystal ball and Hamilton narrowly, not the census metropolitan area of Hamilton, but Hamilton narrowly is projected to grow from roughly 550,000 people to 720,000 people. Now, where are those people going to live? And so we have to have a, a challenge to council around planning, planning development, uh, getting the right density in the right location. So you and I have been watching, I'm sure in the news, there have been complaints about towers that are too tall in the downtown core that, you know, fine to build them 15 stories, don't build them 25. Uh, so we've got that challenge there. But then we've even got places like Ancaster where even a development of six stories for some people are seen as too tall. So we've got to have a cogent strategy. And since council has made the decision, we'll see if they stick with it, but they have made the decision to live within their urban boundary and not 
a, a sprawl, not go out. Well, if you don't go out, the only alternative is to go up to increase the density. So we need a nice cogent plan for all of that as it goes. So that would be number four. Well, number five, uh, this is probably for some people the most controversial on my list and it harkens back to the transition board. So I, I don't want to take ownership of this. I am not the father of area rating, but when we did the amalgamation of the city of Hamilton, normally you would not do it the way we did. It. You would annex rather than amalgamate and you would add urban areas into the existing urban areas and then the remaining rural areas would have their own government. The problem was that through the annexation of places like Ancaster and Dundas and parts of Stony Creek, there just wasn't going to be enough of the rural area left to govern itself. And this is why the province said, rather than doing an annexation process, we're going to do an amalgamation process and bring them in. But we understand that those rural areas are going to receive quite a different level of service than the more urbanized or suburbanized areas within the city. So this is when they invented this thing called area rating. And that would allow a council to take a look at the services being offered within a ward and saying, okay, you don't have this and this and this, so you don't have to pay tax towards that and have differential taxes because of it. Area rating was not designed to live forever. It was designed to be periodically reviewed. And I am not sure there has been a significant review of area rating in nearly 22 years. So this council coming in this fall needs to take this very challenging task to hand and see uh, if all the area rating still applies. Now I can give you an easy example, transit. Uh, no, if you live in Freelton, if you live in um, uh, uh, Carlisle, if you live in other parts of Flamborough, some parts of, of Glanbrook, the old cities of Glanbrook, what have you, no, you don't have bus anywhere near you. You have to walk a mile to get a bus. So probably transit for at least those areas might still need to be area rated. But fire levels have improved. New fire halls have been built. New police areas have been built. Um, and so, you know, do we need all the area rating? And, and I'm even going to suggest forgive me, I'm getting controversial here, that the area rating, as I understand it, and again, I haven't looked at it for 22 years, uh, was done on a ward by ward level. Now, if you look at the ward of Ancaster, which I think is ward uh, 12, if I have my numbers right, um, there is a very urbanized part of ward 12, and then there's a very rural part of ward 12. So it may be that what we need is area rating, but not on an all or nothing basis, but on a, you know this part of Ward 12, okay, you now get the appropriate level of services, you should be paying equally for those, but this part of Ward 12 or this part of Ward 15 or this part of Ward 9, you, know, you don't. Now, I'm not sure area rating at this moment allows that, but I think this would be something that a council could certainly go back to a provincial government who's designed the legislation around area rating and say, here is the problem after 22 years, we are not urbanized right out to the edges of the old or of the, of the new city of Hamilton. We still want to keep some area rating, but it won't be by completely within a ward. It will be in sections within the ward. And I think that will still allow fairness. We don't want people to be paying huge amounts of taxes for services they don't get. And yet on the other side of the coin, those people who are getting it can't hide behind those who aren't getting it. So I think it's time for a fulsome review of area rating. And that's going to be controversial because again, there will be seen as winners and losers. There will be some people who will win, meaning they'll keep their area rating and their taxes will stay lower. There will be other people and those will primarily be in the amalgamated, uh, uh, more suburban areas in Hamilton who may see taxes have to go up and lose their area rating. But I think it's time for that review. Thank you so much, Marvin Ryder, for being on The O Show and for being one of the voices that people trust on the issues that they care about. And if you're enjoying watching The O Show and learning about these important local issues, especially coming up to the October 24th election, please like and subscribe on YouTube. And we'll keep getting the great content to you.